I'm talking today about pervasive threats, so I want to give you an overview of the microbial ecology that we're facing in the infection control trenches. Now, who works in an acute hospital? Okay, so about 50% of the audience. Who's heard of CRE? Who's heard of CPE? We'll come to that, and I'm going to ask you a question on that later. Okay. Isn't it amazing what's happened with MRSA? I mean, come on, we should sort of pat ourselves on the back a little bit. It's been a tremendous effort. I think if you asked somebody in 2003 whether we would affect nationally a 90% plus reduction in MRSA, I mean, you'd have been laughed out of the room, wouldn't you? Nobody believed that it was possible. And yet we've done it, and I think we've done it almost completely legitimately. Although uh, PHE doesn't report how many blood cultures have taken, that's the one little thing. But I, I do think there's been a tremendous reduction in MRSA bacteremia, mainly due to better line care. Now, what has affected this change? I would, I would put it to you that anybody who pins this on a single intervention is off their rocker. So, for those of you who, who did GCSE science, whenever you did an experiment, you had to change one variable at a time. And if you change multiple variables, you don't know which one made the change that you see. And it's the same with the MRSA reduction. Those are just some of the things that we changed almost all at the same time. I think if I had to choose one, it would be making the chief executive personally accountable for the MRSA bacteremia rate. And I'm not, I'm not joking, because that, I think, above everything else, meant a change in culture. IPC suddenly became more powerful and more interesting to the hospital administration. I remember in a previous life, when I was working for a company, I was visiting a hospital, and the chief exec met who I was meeting in the canteen. And, and they said the first thing, they didn't say hello, they said, what's our MRSA number this month? It, it got that kind of focus, and I think that's been a good thing for us in the trenches. And it's the same story for CDF. What I don't have on here is anything about antibiotic changes, uh, because uh, that's a bit more difficult to put on a chart, because there's no single point when, when changes were made. But I, I do think that, again, the, the setting of targets has probably helped us to reduce the, the amount of CDF that we see in our hospitals. By the way, who, who's heard of crapsules? Anybody? Otherwise known as an oral dose of a fecal microbiota transplantation. I mean, we, we, we need to start modulating and thinking carefully about the ecology of our gut. So I agree completely with P Professor Wilcox's uh, views on using ecologically friendly antibiotics. It's really important that we have a phase change in our therapeutic approach to C. diff. And it won't be long, you heard it here first, before each dose of antibiotics is given with some kind of modulation of the gut microbiota and we'll get better at it over the next decade, which will help. But of course, we still need to stop transmitting the darn stuff in hospital as well. So we hear a lot about trust attributable and non-trust attributable and community acquired C. diff infection. I don't think there's been a massive change in epidemiology in terms of increasing uh, C. diff in the community uh, because what we see is that the non-trust attributed cases have fallen with the trust attributable cases, which suggests to me that they were trust attributable all along. It's just the epi definitions didn't pick that up. So what has worked to reduce MRSA? I think the fact that we haven't seen a reduction in MSSA suggests that it's those interventions targeted at MRSA that have made the difference. Things like screening and uh, decolonization of carriers rather than the horizontal um, interventions that we've applied to all patients. OK. If we track ourselves against the rest of Europe, the, the impact is pretty impressive. But th there's no cause for complacency. We still see MRSA bacteremias. We still see C. diff. But what I really want to talk about is this. You know, that's a bit out of date because it's already here. Who's seen a completely pan-drug-resistant gram-negative organism? 
in the lab. Did you spread it? No, don't, don't answer that. <laughs> CRE are nightmare bacteria. Does anyone know who said that? Anyone on the panel? Who's that a quote from? No. It's Tom Frieden at the CDC. Now, um, I'm just... I'm just working through what I'm allowed to say in my head. I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but the CDC is a very, very boring, sober, public health organization. <laughs> and yet they termed CRE nightmare bacteria. And of course the press had a field day. This was all over the US press. So it's, it's amazing that the CDC took that step. It's unprecedented. We've heard about Dame Sally Davies, We've heard about David Cameron and the, the return of the pre antibiotic era. Even Barack Obama has, has jumped on the bandwagon to an extent, although their antibiotic policy is pretty wordy. And perhaps some of the professors on the panel may want to comment on, on where the US are really in tackling this problem. And I think we're ahead of the game, which is good. So, CRE on nightmare bacteria. Now, who care, would care to... to Tell me the difference between a CRE and a CPE. Go on, shout it out. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, very good. So a CRE is a carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. It's a member of the Enterobacteriaceae family that's resistant to the carbapenems by any mechanism, which may or may not be a carbapenemase, which can spread between species. A CPE, carbapenemase-producing Enterobacteriaceae, is the subset of that group that are resistant by means of that particular enzyme. Now, why am I going into that much detail? It's probably too much. But the point is, I'm an MRSA man. I've only just started looking at the gram-negatives. And it is unbelievably confusing. It's an acronym minefield. We've got MDR, GNR, CRE, CPC, uh, KPC, NDM, ESBL. It, you know, it goes on and on and on. And I don't think any, anybody knows what anybody else is really talking about. So one, one thing on my wish list is that we, w that we come up with some defined acronyms that we all start to use. That would improve things a lot. So what's the problem? Around about a third of all infections are caused by gram-negative rods, two-thirds in the ICU due to the underlying susceptibility of their patients, split into two broad groups, the Enterobacteriaceae and the non-fermenters. I won't talk much about the non-fermenters today, things like Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas. They're important, but they're not as important for three reasons. Firstly, resistance. This is an antibiogram from a London hospital from last year. Pan drug resistant to the fluoroquinolones, to colistin and to the carbapenems, the three antibiotic targets of the charity that we talked about earlier. And that makes sense. We need new antibiotics for the gram negatives. By the way, what, what, how, what would you treat that patient with if it has a pan drug resistant? Colistin, high dose carbapenem, pentotherapy. So, uh, sorry? Ticocycline, yeah, I mean, it was resistant to tibia in this case. But, you know, an ID physician told me that when you've got a pan-drug-resistant organism, you give them lots of antibiotics, but it's actually more for the treating doctor than it is for the patient to feel like you're doing something, because in reality, it's resistant, and that's what we're facing increasingly. But, unlike other highly resistant organisms that we've dealt with, the classic being vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus, these enterobacteriaceae retain the ability to cause high mortality infections. So if we look at the invasive infections with Klebsiella pneumoniae that produces NDM, the, the mortality is 50%, so half of these patients die. Now, not all of those are necessarily because of their infection, but, but it is high. And the third problem is spread. So not only do we have the spread of the clonal organism, we also have the potential for horizontal gene transfer combined with gastrointestinal colonization, which is very difficult to get rid of, 
and I think m perhaps even most importantly, the ability to establish a community reservoir of colonization, because these organisms are normal inhabitants of the gut, and once they get in, they're very difficult to get out. Now, I don't have time to go into detail, and it's, it's new science, but for a long time, we haven't had any way of decolonizing the gut if somebody has a resistant Enterobacteria, Enterobacteriaceae species in there. But actually, some French researchers have just found that a single dose of fecal microbiota transplantation, crapsule if you like, was effective in decolonizing a carrier of a resistant gram-negative species. And I think that's a really important development and something we need to look at really closely. So what's going on in, in Europe? Greece is, is in big trouble in all sorts of ways, um, particularly with their resistant gram-negatives. Up to 60% of their invasive clebs are now CRE. Italy, I think, is even more concerning because they had nothing at all relatively until 2009, and then bang, national outbreak of a clonal CRE. And I think we, as a country, need to learn a lesson very carefully on that. So in the UK, we haven't seen many cases or the problems that they've seen in the US, but there has been a steady increase in the number of isolates referred to the National Reference Lab. Now, there may be some referral bias here, because um, the, the lab actually asked us to send the isolates their way. But I do think there's a genuine increase. And if, if you look at my institution, we have certainly seen an increase over the last few years, particularly in recent months. So colistin is, is often all that's left. But actually, in Italy, in the Italian outbreak, 43% of their resistant klebs were also colistin resistant. Now, it's not quite as bad as it looks, because only 1% of these isolates were totally pan-drug resistant. So for 99% of them, there was another agent that was, a, that was usable. Uh, but the trend is worrying, certainly. Now, this is an amazing study that was published in, in the US literature a couple of years ago. And this suggests that the rate of carbapenem resistance in Kleb Pneumo in a, in a national survey went from less than 2% in 2001 to more than 10% in 2011. So one in 10 of their Kleb pneumos that they're, that they're pulling out are resistant to carbapenems. That's a lot higher than we see here, even in the areas of higher prevalence. So it's a worry. I think the US are ahead of us. So what do we do about this? We have had um, a set of guidelines from PHE. We've had a patient safety alert and a letter to all chief executives saying, please, can you do something about this? Now, I think that's the first time that's ever happened. I don't think that ever happened with MRSA or C. diff. So we've had unprecedented action all around CRE, even though there's been very few cases. And actually, I think that response matches the risk that we're facing even though the actuality isn't there in most cases. And there's also a toolkit in the US uh, which provides some sensible guidance. One of the big questions and question marks about implementing the toolkit is who do we screen at the time of admission? How do we know who is at high risk? We did a, I was at Guys and Tommy's before Imperial, and we did a big study where we did a universal screen of all admissions. And we actually found a very low carriage rate. But the risk factors in the toolkit pretty much match the, the risk factors that we found in terms of overseas hospitalization and overseas residence. And in, at Imperial, we've just started screening a much broader population at the time of admission. Um, so we'll be able to report some, some carriage rates soon. So, where does CRE fit in response to the, in, in comparison with the usual suspects? I think we know and understand MRSA, VRE, and C. diff quite well. So if we talk about antibody resistance and resistance genes, actually it was quite straightforward with MRSA and VRE. You had a single species and a single resistance mechanism. That's all you had to worry about. With CRE, because of the, the complexity of the issue, it's very difficult to pin down. We've got multiple species to begin with, Klebnumo, E. coli, Enterobacter, and the list goes on. We have multiple resistance genes, 
in terms of the carbapenemases, the big five, and we have multiple resistance mechanisms. Now, I sometimes find that I'm struggling to explain all this nuance to fellow professionals in infection control. Try explaining it to a general surgeon. I have a good friend who's a consultant general surgeon in Nottingham. And I said, how's your CRE going? He said, CR what? <laughs> it might be because they call it something different up there. I hope not. But the, the, the point is, I think there's a big education job for us to do to make sure that our colleagues are aware. By the way, there's, a, there's an infamous case where um, an acronym caused a problem because a patient was transferred with a CPC to a ward. And the admitting ward said, oh, well, they've got a CPC. That's nice. Put them in a bay and spread CRE around the ward because they didn't recognize the label. So we, that's, you know, it's not just semantics. We need to get our nomenclature right and agreed. As I mentioned, the resistant enterobacteriaceae have the ability to establish a community reservoir, and that's really key and, and unique to a great degree with the ability to, to affect all patients potentially. Decolonization is, is tricky. They retain virulence, and the environment is less important for the enterobacteriaceae than for others, although they will survive for longer than you might expect. So what do we do about this? If I was to summarize the studies that have evaluated a single infection control intervention outside of an outbreak setting, I would be talking about zero studies. There's not a single one that has evaluated a single measure outside of an outbreak. So the truth is, we actually don't know what to do to prevent the transmission of these organisms. So since we don't know what to do, we have to throw the kitchen sink at it. That's all we can do. So we're looking at screening, contact precautions, antibiotic stewardship, hand hygiene, and cleaning and disinfection as the pillars of our response. I think everybody would agree that we have to do all of those things at least some of the time. And then there's some more controversial issues. What's the role of environmental screening, education, note flagging, cohorting of staff and patients, decolonization, and dare I say it, screening of healthcare workers. That's a thorny issue. <laughs>